Hey everyone, and welcome to a brand new year. <laughs> Tonight we have four stories. I hope you all enjoy them. If you do, please be sure to drop a like rating, subscribing, commenting, sharing. Of course, all of that is very much appreciated as well. Let's see if we can reach 1,000 likes on this one. Anyways, sit back, get comfortable, do whatever it is that you do to relax, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. My grandfather passed away about eight months ago. It still feels a little surreal. I'd always been close to him. When I was little, I would visit him every year for summer break. My mom didn't have to find a daycare or sitter while school was out, and I got to go swimming and fishing in the lake behind his house. Win-win. Each summer, he would have new activities planned. Sometimes we would try new fishing techniques. Other years, we would go hunting for deer in the rolling fields and wooded sections of his land. It was nearly 80 acres, which felt like an infinite amount of space to explore as a kid. One year, we spent nearly two whole months building a treehouse overlooking the lake. It was a miracle neither of us fell out of the trees and broke something. Or worse. All of my fondest memories happened out there with my grandpa. The last summer I spent with him, he had already started drafting up plans for the next year. We were going to build a deck stretching out onto the lake that you could go fishing right off the side of. Maybe he had finally gotten tired of repairing our rickety old rowboat we always took out. It would be the biggest project we had undertaken by far. It might have taken a couple summers to get it done. I was so excited. My parents had to practically drag me back home. But the deck never got built. That winter, my grandpa started having some issues. He would call my mom in the middle of the night ranting and raving about things that didn't make any sense. Most of the time, she could get him to calm down. One time it got so bad, she had to drive all the way out to his house, nearly two hours, in the middle of the night and stay with him for a few days. I could see it was tough on her. Unfortunately, he only got worse over time. His neighbors found him wandering around in the woods in his pajamas more than once, unable to find his way back home. By the next spring, it was clear he couldn't live on his own anymore. Against his protests, my mom moved him into an assisted care facility only a few minutes away from us. I went with her to visit a couple of times every week. For a while, he was happy to see us. Then he was just confused. Eventually, he didn't respond much at all. Everything happened so fast. One day, we were hanging out fishing and listening to old Hank Williams songs. The next day, he was nothing but a shell. He lived in that care facility for about five years. It was longer than the doctors had initially estimated. Near the end, I wasn't sure if it was a blessing or a curse. He passed just a few days before his 70th birthday. We had the funeral reception out at his house. My mom and I had to do some cleaning and repairs beforehand. After sitting mostly untouched for five years, it was still in pretty decent shape, all things considered. The ceremony and reception were both small, but nice. After the reception, I went and stood out by the lake by myself for a while. It was only a maybe couple hundred feet across, but it seemed much bigger when I was just a kid. I got quite the surprise a couple days later. At the reading of my grandpa's will, we found out he had left the house and land to me. He had written it only a few months before my last summer with him. I could feel my aunt's barely veiled jealousy, but at least my mom was happy for me. She offered to help me fix up the few remaining things we hadn't gotten to before the reception. She even said she'd help me pay for movers if I decided to move in completely. I wasn't ready for that just yet. I still needed to finish school, and I had a feeling there was probably more to be done around the lot than it seemed on the surface. 
but every weekend I drove up and did a little bit more to get it ready. Clearing out dead trees, replacing the warped old siding on the house, pouring new gravel for the driveway. It was slow going, but I was getting closer every day. Then one day a few months ago, while I was cleaning piles of junk out of the garage, I found some rough blueprints still spread out on my grandpa's old workbench. It was the plans for the lake dock, our grand project we never got to build. I'd be lying if I said I didn't get a little emotional looking them over. They were basically all done, missing a few measurements, but nothing too crazy. So I decided right then and there, I was going to build the deck. I would finish this one last summer project. I went and bought most of the lumber and hardware the following week. I also bought a water depth gauge so I could get the last measurements I needed. The height of the posts at the end, which would go down into the lake. If it was more than 15 feet or so, I would probably just get some anchors and let it float. But the original plans called for posts, so I figured I would stick to it if I could. The next weekend, I was back out at the house. I borrowed a friend's pickup to haul most everything out in one trip. I also bought some food, water, and other essentials. It would make building a lot easier if I just stayed out at the house for a few days without having to drive back and forth to town. Enough of my grandparents' furniture was still there to make shorter stays comfortable enough. The first thing I did was go out to get the depth measurements I needed. I dragged the old rowboat to the overgrown grassy shore of the lake, praying the whole time that it would stay afloat at least long enough for me to get the reading. The meter I got seemed simple enough. It looked like a flashlight. You're supposed to stick it in at the surface of the water, and it uses a laser to tell how far it is to the bottom. The wonders of modern technology. Lucky for me, the boat still floated, and didn't seem to have any major leaks. I hopped aboard and paddled out about 30 feet to where the end of the dock would be. I uncapped the depth meter, stuck it in, flipped the switch, and nothing. The display on the side just kept flashing, reading, for what seemed like an unusual length of time. After a minute or so, the message changed to error, and it turned back off. I tried a few more times, but the result was the same. The wonders of modern technology. And so I headed back to the hardware store. Luckily, there was a smaller one closer to the house, so I didn't have to go all the way back into town. I bought another water depth meter. This one was more old school. Just a weight on the end of a line that you could spool out. Once it hit the bottom, you could just read the numbers on the line. Basically a tape measure with a hunk of metal at the end. Probably what I should have gotten in the first place. I got back to the house and rode out onto the lake once more. I tossed the weight into the water and let it start to sink, but it didn't stop. The line kept going, unspooling more and more, almost seeming to pick up speed. 15 feet, 30 feet, 50 feet. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It eventually stopped at 100 feet. Not because it had hit anything, but because that was as far as my meter line went. That couldn't possibly be right. Sure, I had never touched the bottom as a kid, but it couldn't be that deep, could it? I spent a few minutes reeling it back in and tried again, thinking somehow it would be different, but sure enough, it only stopped when there was no line left to give. I just stood there scratching my head for a bit, unsure on where to even go from here. Should I get a longer line? Even if I did hit the bottom, it wasn't like I could use posts for the dock now. As I thought on it, the water depth meter slipped from my hands and fell off the side of the boat. It immediately disappeared from the surface, dragged down by the weight on the other end. Well, what a waste of thirty dollars, I thought to myself. I sat back on the boat for a while doing some quick searches on my phone. After 15 minutes or so, the boat suddenly lurched. I steadied myself, almost losing my lone paddle over the side as well. 
It felt like the world's shortest earthquake, and I could see ripples hitting the shores on all sides. Before I could even guess at what it was, a loud splash erupted beside me and showered me in murky lake water. Something flew out of the water, straight up in the air so fast I barely saw it. I shielded my head as it fell back down, landing hard with a resounding thunk between my legs. I cracked one eye open after a few moments. I thought the boat was still moving, but I quickly realized it was just my own trembling. There in the bottom of the boat was the metal weight from the end of my depth meter, still attached to a few feet of line. The line looked like it had been torn off, and what was left was frayed and mangled. I rode back to shore faster than I had ever rode before. As I did, I could have sworn the surface of the lake started to swirl and pull back from the edges. I paddled harder. As I reached the grass, I crawled from the boat and took a few moments to catch my breath. Looking back from the safety of firm ground, all I saw was a once again calm lake. The sun starting to set in the distance and glinting off the glass-like surface. I was bewildered and shaken up in equal measure. What the hell was that? I went inside and dried off the best I could. I changed into my pajamas and sat by the back door staring out at the lake. Part of me just wanted to hop in the truck and leave, but I couldn't. All I could do was watch the surface, waiting for something else to happen. Every time a dragonfly would land on the lake or a toad would hop out, I nearly jumped out of my skin. The reasonable thoughts of doubt started to creep into my mind. Maybe I had just imagined it. Maybe there was a very rational and mundane explanation for all of this. Every time these thoughts came back, I looked at the remains of the depth line on the kitchen counter, and then I looked back out at the lake. After a few hours, I felt my eyelids start to grow heavy. I fought violently, but I soon lost the battle to my weariness. I had vivid dreams, the kind that you can't remember, not that you'd want to, the kind that leaves you in a cold sweat in the middle of the night. Sure enough, I woke in a gasp, nearly falling out of the dining room chair I had commandeered for my lookout. As I steadied my breathing and regained my senses, I looked back to the lake almost immediately. Nothing. Just the moonlight on a calm little patch of water. Once again, I started to question what had happened earlier. Maybe it had just been some large deep water crocodile or something. Were those a thing? I looked back at the broken depth meter again, as if it held some sort of secrets that would answer everything for me. It didn't, but as I looked it over once more, the light from outside grew brighter. It was subtle at first, like the moon moving out from behind a cloud, but it kept getting brighter still. As I looked back outside, I saw its source. The lake had begun to grow with an ethereal blue-green light. Ripples had appeared on its surface, starting in the center and moving outward. At first, they only came every minute or so, but they got faster as the lake grew brighter. In my ears, I started to hear a low hum and an uncomfortable pressure like descending in an airplane. I tried to run, to grab the car keys and leave, but my legs refused to budge. The lake began to rise unnaturally, like some sort of huge bubble was pushing its way upward, creating a dome of swirling water and pulsing light. It rose up and up until it was taller than the house and all the trees surrounding it. Finally, I felt myself stand up and my brief sense of relief turned to horror as I felt my legs walking on their own accord towards the back door, towards the lake. Soon I felt grass under my bare feet and a spray of cool mist covered my skin. I couldn't stop myself. I couldn't even blink. The dome of water had stopped growing. The light started flashing irregularly. Like, the lake held inside it a violent thunderstorm. In the flashes, I started to make out some sort of solid shape. It was massive, easily 50 feet across, 
It seemed to be curled in on itself like a seashell or a hurricane, but the edges were spotted with tendrils here and there that twitched and flicked like a cat's tail. In the center, the light was strongest, and it seemed to shine down on me like a spotlight. I screamed, or at least it felt like I did. I kept walking forward at a steady pace until I was only a few feet from the wall of water. One of the tendrils stretched out and waited just underneath the surface, beckoning me to come forward. A voice in my head spoke louder than my own thoughts. Come in. It said, the words leaking right through the folds of my brain. He's already here. I've seen you in his memories. I kept walking. I held out my hand. I embraced the inevitable. The next thing I knew, I was sitting in a house I didn't recognize. One of the neighbor's places, I soon learned. He told me how he had found me wandering in the woods in my pajamas soaking wet. He said it gave him deja vu, from when he had found my grandpa years ago. My mom showed up to get me an hour or so later. I couldn't read much from her face, and we didn't say anything on the drive back to her house. The next few weeks were filled with scans and tests, doctors and specialists. I usually zone out when they go over the results, but the gist is always the same. Nothing wrong. I have to run some more tests. It always makes me laugh, but I know my mom doesn't see any humor in it. I've been getting worse all the while. It's hard for me to think straight, and sometimes I feel like I'm dreaming even when I'm awake. I've been forgetting things, just little things here and there, but they're starting to add up. Even my favorite memories of my grandpa are starting to feel blurry and fade in. I can still feel the remnants of joy when I focus, but the details are getting harder and harder to grasp. So I decided to write this all down before it too starts to fade away. I don't know what was out in that lake. My mom said she's selling the place, and she makes sure I don't leave the house without her. At least not until I'm all better. But somehow, some way I just know. In the end... I'll be back at that lake. I played outside alone. That was the unwritten rule. When I was a kid, both of my parents worked from home. They preferred silence and strongly encouraged me to go outside after school. Between the ages of six and ten, I spent a few hours each day in the backyard, which kind of sucked. The space was large and had half a dozen mature trees, but there wasn't much to do. Plus, the furthest end of the yard was all mud and roots from dead trees on the other side of the chain link fence. The property on the other side looked abandoned. A portion of the small house in the opposing backyard had crumbled. It may have been a heritage ruin. There are a number of such rotting locations in Bridal Veil vale Lake. It's like the town makes them historical landmarks to avoid having to deal with them. I never found the front of the property on the other side of the block, where all the houses are somewhat modern looking and clearly not wreckages of stone. The heritage site must be enclosed by a newer neighborhood or sitting on somebody's property, and they didn't want to deal with it any more than the town did. Whatever the case, I usually avoided going to the back of my yard because it was creepy and easy to trip on the roots and fall into the sucking mud. My stressed out parents weren't happy if I came in filthy, which, of course, limited play options further. I generally sat on the limestone rocks I'd gathered from the back of the yard and waited to be allowed in, often watching the abandoned property for lack of a better option. Staring at my own house had also irked my parents for some reason. On a grey day in January, when more rain than snow had fallen, I sat thinking about my Christmas toys inside my bedroom. It was foggy, and I couldn't see the back half of the yard. Eric? A woman's voice said quietly but clearly. Hello? I thought somebody was calling from the other side of the fence. 
I'd never seen anyone back there, but it was possible. How she would know my name, I didn't know, but it's not a huge town. Be pretty funny if the property I believed abandoned belonged to a friend's parents. Hello? I asked again. I got off my rock and took a few steps to try and see better. No one responded. I got a shiver and nearly fell over when my dad was suddenly standing behind me. Come inside, Eric, he said. It's supper time. He sounded irritated. I found out why when I got to the table and my mom was there wearing the same expression. What are you doing outside? My father asked. He unfurled his napkin with a wrist snap. Outside? Nothing. I wanted to add as usual, but knew I'd get in trouble for it. Punishments were always chores, and I didn't want to waste more time not playing with my new toys. What was all the noise then? What noise? Somebody screaming bloody murder? My mom's son. I shrugged. I didn't hear any screams. Also, they heard screaming and didn't come outside to see if I was okay. I was too young at the time to understand the full, immature people my parents were. Enough, my dad's son. You're clearly lying. Eat. We will discuss the consequences afterward. There was no point in arguing. I ate and only had to do the dishes after. Light punishment for lying, unless they didn't really believe I had. I finished up, played with my toys, and got ready for bed. I had trouble falling asleep. I had to go to bed too early so my parents could pull some more hours of work in peace. The quiet play in my room was too distracting, obviously. Wide awake, I crept to the window. It was dark outside and still foggy. Hours of my days were spent looking at nothing. I lamented. School was pretty boring. Recesses were too brief. Having friends over was forbidden. I wasn't allowed to go anywhere. I started to cry. Shh. A woman soothed. I saw no one and yet my eyes were drawn to the yard below, where a shadowy figure now stood in the fog. Don't cry, Eric, she said. But like, directly into my ear. I swear I felt a gentle breath against my skin. I didn't respond. I backed away from the window slowly and crawled into bed, pulling the blanket over my head. Pressure from a hand fell against my leg and stroked it gently. I was scared, but not enough to dare violate the silence my parents required. I'd rather die, I realized. The ghostly hand continued until I, at last, gave in to imagining a caring adult was comforting me. I slept, but not through the night. Only a few hours passed when a prolonged cry of abject horror filled our home. My parents, not yet finished for the night, burst into my room together. The covers were ripped from my hands and they both began with many false accusations. There were too many to recall, but they all amounted to something like, You don't care about this family. I wasn't screaming, I said. Please listen. It wasn't me. Not another peep. My father shouted before they left and slammed the door. I felt hopeless. Their disbelief put us all at risk. Somebody had screamed inside our house. Were we really just going to ignore it? Why wouldn't they believe me? I got dressed. Let them die, I thought. I was done. This would be my first attempt at running away. Naturally, I would need money to begin a new life. I had none, but understood people might pay me for my service rendered. I would be a painter. I put a single plastic tube of paint and a small brush into my coat pocket and was ready to go. It was easier to escape out the back door. The backyard looked darker and filled with even thicker fog. I only had to walk down the side steps and around the deck to get to the driveway gate. Eric, the woman said. Eric, don't leave me. I'm cold. Her voice was a loud whisper between my ears. Eric, come, please. 
Come and get me out. Eric, I'm stuck in the roots. The mud. Eric, Eric, please. She sounded so desperate. I went into the fog and to the muddy portion of the yard, tripping immediately on the first root to catch my foot. I landed in a pile of leaves, not realizing I'd reached the chain link fence faster than expected. My fingers felt smooth in the dark. I recoiled and stood up. There was a face in the leaves. Her mouth opened and closed like a fish. She was gasping for air. Are you alright? It was a dumb question. I'll call the police. Help me. She shrieked. It wasn't some telepathy this time. It was her mouth. Her lungs. I lurched further into the leaf pile, cold mud mouths sucking my shoes off. I was up to my knees and I could see her face more clearly. She was young and pretty and utterly afraid. How was she stuck? How was I going to get her out? As I stood there trying to figure out what to do, she continued screaming and my parents appeared from the fog. She's stuck, I told them urgently. They were confused and appeared at a loss for words. My hands found her arms beneath the pile. That's when her expression changed from fear to childish glee. Something, not hands, grabbed my back and started to pull. It was so much easier to pull someone down than up. I fell into the leaves, my face against hers. She smelled of vegetation and soil and coppery blood. I was older when I found out, she whispered in my ear. I fought hard against the roots, pulling me down with her. I'm not sure if it was me that was able to spin around or if she, whatever she was, simply allowed it. My parents were there, just watching with a mixture of excitement and fear. Little smiles curved their lips. I reached for them. Help me. My mother moved closer to my dad. He wrapped an arm around her shoulders and said something I couldn't hear into her ear. The roots, her hands, continued pulling down until the dull light of night faded. I held my breath, buried under the mud. A little longer, you must know, she said. The urge to draw air began fast. You use more oxygen when you're afraid. One breath of dirt would be the end, wouldn't it? You want to know what they said? The woman said, the Lady of Leaves. I can tell you, but I think you already know. Does that make your choice easier? What choice? I only thought about the question. She answered similarly. The choice to stay with me, someone who loves you, or to go back with someone who doesn't. She didn't confirm or deny the idea. I want to live. So be it, she said. Suddenly I was breathing cold air rapidly and struggling to stay conscious. I was vaguely aware of my parents but couldn't be sure of what they were doing. There was a car ride or an ambulance and then I was in a hospital where I recovered. The doctor explained I'd fallen and bumped my head. I nearly drowned in the mud until my dad pulled me up. With my parents in the room, there was no point in denying this version of events. I waited until we were in the car to challenge them. You didn't help me, I said as my mom pulled out of the parking lot. What's that? My dad said, looking at his phone. When she pulled into the mud, I said, you just watched. You didn't help. My dad finally looked at me. Huh? What are you saying? She was in the leaves. I said. My father looked alarmed. Who was in the leaves, Eric? I don't know. A woman? A young woman. She pulled me under the mud with the tree roots and... I think we should go back to the hospital. He said to my mom. He's just confused. My mom said. We've been working too much. Our stress is becoming his. She faced the road. We need to do better. Why was he outside in the first place? 
There's a question, he said. Why did you go out last night, Eric? I... after the screaming, I heard... Why were you screaming, Eric? Let him answer. My mom chided my dad. Sorry, sorry, Eric. I wasn't screaming, I said. My parents exchanged a quick glance, and I knew it was over. I was outnumbered by superior foes. They had their narrative, and to be fair, made more sense than mine. Therapy was on the horizon. My parents took some time off from work. I didn't have to go to school, and I got to stay in and play with my toys. We watched movies and ordered a lot of takeout. I was starting to feel better and accept that I had just been stressed out and confused to the point of hallucinating. The following week, however, my dad wanted to show me something in the backyard. I hadn't been out there since that horrible night. Come on, he said. I found something you'll want to see. He walked in front of me as we went to the back of the yard, obscuring the view until we were on top of the spot. A filthy mannequin head sat on top of the pile beside a one-armed plastic torso and a pair of legs. I haven't found the rest yet, my dad's son. I was wondering about what you'd said in the car and found the face right away. Why would somebody bury this here? And when? Must have been a long time ago. It was all tangled in roots. I know what I saw. I remember the feel of her smooth cheek against mine, the house beyond the chain-link fence, with its rotted trees, held a single shadow in a tiny window before it moved out of sight. It's for the best. I saw him. What? That's what you whispered to mom. It's for the best. The lady in the leaves pulled me under. I begged you for help and you said, it's for the best. My dad looked guilty. He looked at the mannequin pile, evidence he must have planted and gestured weakly in his defense. I... Eric, you were confused. I'm sorry you think we'd... do something like that. Who was she? I pressured. Who's buried here? I don't know what you're talking about. He sudden and walked away, leaving me again. I crouched by the mannequin for a moment before movement in the yard caught my eye. She stood, unobscured between the dead trunks, and naked except for some leaves and dirt in her hair, on her body. Her smile was mischievous and sad, if that makes any sense. I think that's maybe just the way her face is and why someone killed her. They didn't like the way she smiled. When my mom called from the back of the house, the lady waved and walked behind a tree. I did not see her again, but never forgot her lesson. My parents were not trustworthy. The years that followed were difficult. I ignored the clumsy attempts my parents made to repair our relationship and stayed out of the house and around Bridal Vale Lake as much as possible. Therapy and medication only brought more clarity to confirm my suspicions of their motives. I went to the library often to try and learn about the property behind our home, but couldn't find anything. I started searching through my parents' stuff when they were at work and I was supposed to be in school. That's when I found the photo. That's when I found my lady in the leaves again. I waited until my 18th birthday to place the photo on the dinner table. They'd just finished putting down the cake, singing happy birthday. Who is she? I asked, but they didn't answer. I'm leaving, I told them. It's for the best. I haven't been back since, and I'm no closer to figuring out the identity of the lady and what happened to her. I feel a bit awkward about this, but here goes. A few weeks ago, I was browsing the internet late at night when some ads appeared. Not the kind of ads you might expect. They were RPG items. Yes, I admit, I'm a bit of a nerd. It caught me off guard because of how specific the algorithms seemed to be. 
just a few days earlier. I had been discussing with friends our plans to play a game soon, and I mentioned wanting to get some miniatures. Lo and behold, miniature ads showed up. I checked out the few offers, here and there, and don't get me wrong, I'm not a big fan of 3D prints. The relief finish looks, in my opinion, unsightly, too irregular. Until I stumbled upon a figurine that would be perfect for a boss. Some kind of king, I suppose. A strong male torso with tentacles entangling the waist and an octopus head. The finish was perfect too. Nothing too elaborate or machined. I assume it's handcrafted. The price wasn't too high, around $25, so there was no reason to hesitate. I bought it and informed my friends that we now had a boss for the campaign. Days passed and I regularly checked the shipping progress. About a week later, the mail carrier left a rectangular cardboard package with a seal that read Miskatonic Arts and a bright red sticker with tentacles coming out from the sides. Cool, I thought. Maybe they specialize in crafting cephalopods for games. I went in and quickly opened the box. The statue was quite attractive, even before touching it I noticed an emerald glow emanating from it. I couldn't recall buying a deluxe version of one with additional special effects. I picked it up and to the touch it felt slightly warm. About 3 to 5 degrees warmer than room temperature. This will definitely surprise the guys. I opened the app to confirm the delivery when I noticed a message from the sender. We've received a delivery confirmation. Is everything okay with the product? I promptly started typing. Uh, everything's fine. Just to confirm, maybe you guys sent me a slightly better product than what I paid for? It has some extra glow features, is that correct? If so, is it battery powered or battery operated? A few minutes passed with no response. Yes, friend. Thanks for buying from us. They confirmed the delivery, and then the chat ended. I was confused. Yes to what? Well, better let it go. I took a photo to share with the group. For some reason, the photos came out as if they were experiencing interference with a lot of noise. Could it have something to do with the battery? My god, is it radioactive? I started to panic while sending the photos to my friends and sharing my distress. They reassured me, saying there was nothing to worry about. At most, it could have been a layer of radium in the paint finish, but it wouldn't be more dangerous than a smoke detector or a banana, as long as I didn't start eating the statue, which I had no intention of doing. We scheduled to play on the weekend, and I prepared for bed, leaving the statue decorating the living room coffee table. I tried to forget the unease that the strange object caused me, even without reason. I laid my head on the pillow, letting my thoughts flow into the night drain, calming my breathing, but there was no peace, not even in my dreams. In my mind, I woke up in an open field, the sky shining with stars and the Milky Way's own trail, a thin layer of water barely covering my feet. Spread across the ground, seemingly endless, mountains rose from somewhere in the background, and then a faint, subtle sound began. It was a noise, constant and slow, a scraping sound of stone. In the middle of all this, I began to see circular ripples forming at a point, as if something were coming from the depths, slowly approaching the surface. I approached and looked. To my horror, what emerged was a familiar shape, first an octopus, then a torso, and more tentacles. I began to sweat and upon touching it this time, the statue was boiling. I woke up sweaty and breathless with my alarm in the background. I got up, still stunned by my reverie, and began to get ready for work. However, as I put on my clothes and headed to the front door, I noticed something strange. It may sound silly, maybe it was just confusion on my part, but the statue that was once facing the window, with its back to the door, now stared directly at me. 
I felt a chill in my stomach as it locked eyes with me, and I rushed to work, wishing time would pass slowly. It didn't take long. In the following days, I started experiencing inexplicable chills as I looked at the miniature. Sometimes I swore I could hear it whispering. I decided to put it back in the box until game day, but the whispers persisted at night, turning into indistinct voices echoing through my dreams. Vivid and disturbing dreams. I found myself wandering through strange lands, sometimes alone, sometimes followed by shadowy figures moving in the shadows, but always accompanied by the statue. My health deteriorated into a wreck, probably due to lack of sleep. I had a fever, confusion, body aches, and tremendous discomfort. I went to the doctor and he attributed it to stress, recommending some days off work. But being away from work only brought me closer to that thing. Gradually, my plumbing started deteriorating too, first with a thick black liquid oozing from it, then pieces of I don't know what, something sticky and slimy clogging everything. The smell of the sea made me nauseous. I tried returning it in every way, but I can't contact the company. I'm afraid to leave it on the street and someone might find it, perhaps even a child, and suffer the same fate. Or maybe am I just going insane? No, definitely not after the last incident. It's the eve of the game night, and I started preparing things. Maps, character sheets, quest papers, some dice, snacks, and finally, the miniature. It was time to act like a functional adult and put this nonsense aside. Perhaps it really is stress killing me. It was then as I moved it from the box that I noticed something strange. Peculiar engravings all over its body and base. Inscriptions in some kind of ancient language. Things that weren't there before. But that's not all. Far from it. Shortly after, the kitchen sink overflowed with water, completely clogged. I was furious and determined to fix it in one go. No cleaning products or on cloggers. I wanted to express my anger in brute force. I removed the sink trap and started pulling with all my might using the plunger. What came out was the weirdest thing I had ever seen. An octopus. But not like I imagined them, after all. What kind of octopus has green eyes? And what kind of octopus speaks? It spoke to me in something I didn't understand, but I knew it was what was written on the statue. Its words entered my mind, penetrating flesh and spirit. I understood. I understood what it wanted. It's wonderful. I've already planned everything for the game night with my friends tomorrow. It will be wonderful. I have everything planned for each one of them. That's why I'm writing here. If you're planning to play with your friends, try checking out Miskatonic Arts. You'll surely find something useful for your enjoyment. Definitely 5 out of 5 stars. And I definitely plan to buy again. Part 1. Well, it's my first time doing this, so I think an introduction is in order. My name is Jake. I'm a young American, and less than a month ago, I started working the night shift at a convenience store in Denton, Texas. The job is to save money for college, since I wasn't fortunate enough to come from a wealthy family or succeed in school, either in sports or academics. The routine, though monotonous, has its calm and tranquility. I organize shelves, attend to sporadic customers, and, of course, take the opportunity to study between customers. The first point is that, yes, it messes with your biological clock. I'm only just starting to get used to it in these last few days. My shift is from 10pm to 6am. But, on the other hand, the sleeping city creates a unique atmosphere during the wee hours. The yellow lights of the gas station cast soft shadows on the asphalt, and the constant hum of the refrigerator is my soundtrack. 
as mundane as it may be at times, the comforting solitude of this hour is something I appreciate. While the world sleeps, I'm here, earning a few bucks to build my future. If that were the only thing, I wouldn't be writing here. But I need to report to someone who understands the events of last night. As always, I arrived for another night shift and was greeted by Ryan, my co-worker. A nice guy, but always seemed a bit tense. They say he got involved with drugs in high school and owed some people money. His shift ends before mine, so sometimes our schedules overlap when he does overtime. During one of the breaks, Ryan told me about a strange guy he had seen lurking around earlier. He said the guy seemed out of place, watching everything with a disturbing look, wearing sunglasses and a cap, like a movie disguise. He said the guy seemed to be keeping an eye on the gas station's activity. I thought it might be someone after Ryan, given his history, or in the worst case, I should be alert for a possible robbery. Just to be safe, we decided to inform Mr. Gonzalez, our boss. He's an elderly Mexican man who is well respected in the town, said to be one of the oldest residents. He usually keeps a gun under the counter, in addition to the one he carries with him. The sheriff, apparently a close friend of Mr. Gonzalez, even came here with him to warn us that if necessary, we should use that gun for safety, along with a hidden button that sends an alert to the boss's phone. After reporting the situation, he simply shrugged and said there was nothing to worry about. Everyone knew who he was in the area, and if things got tough, just press the button and he would come. He even swore to be on standby during that night. Hours later, Ryan left for home, leaving me alone and wishing me good luck. The store fell silent, only the distant sounds of the city echoing. Slowly, the fear left my body. I grabbed an energy drink and started reading a book. About an hour passed, around midnight, when I noticed a suspicious customer entering a black van. He refueled quickly while staring into the store, then decided to come in. He wore a cap that covered half of his face and his eyes seemed to examine every corner of the store. He looked like the guy Ryan described, so my tension increased. I kept my finger on the button under the table. The suspicious customer just wandered through the aisles, examining the products, nothing abnormal. Then he picked up a pack of cigarettes, condoms, and left. I chuckled internally, understanding what had happened and how I had worried for nothing. It was just a country guy afraid of Puritan neighbors and becoming local gossip. That relieved my tension. But only for a moment. As he left, a strange feeling enveloped me, as if the air were electrically charged. For a brief moment, the light flickered, coming back quickly but not completely. I became tense when I saw that a specific corner of the store was dark. Almost impossible to distinguish with the naked eye. That caught my attention, and every few seconds, my vision was drawn and coerced to look there. With each glance, the hairs on my neck raised more. It was as if there was something there, as if my subconscious knew. Suddenly a sound of something metallic falling echoed through the dark aisle. I jumped back, freezing in place. Ah, you're a clown. I thought, it's just a poorly placed can on the shelf. Don't let Ryan's paranoia get to you. I took the first step to move to the aisle when suddenly, another noise began. This time more constant. It was the can that had fallen, but this time it rolled toward me, hitting my foot. I looked at it as it stopped and it was open. There was someone inside the damn store. I looked into the darkness and could swear I saw something taking shape. A slender, feminine figure walking towards me. Was I crazy? I hoped so. But that thing started to approach. Methodically and rhythmically. I didn't want to reach for the gun. 
I knew there was a chance I was in danger, so what I did was discreetly press the button under the table and run to the warehouse at the back of the store. As I started running, I could hear footsteps behind me running too. Very fast. She seemed to almost not touch the ground, and still got so close. I reached the door and slammed it behind me. Milliseconds before feeling the impact of her weight being thrown against the metal structure. I turned the clock. The store was extremely heavy and resistant. I was sure I could spend the rest of the night peacefully inside until I saw her blows making the door shake. I calmed down as the power of the attacks gradually subsided. A good amount of time had passed. How much? I don't know. I made the mistake of leaving my phone on the counter when I ran. I didn't want to risk going out before making sure it was safe, and the lack of windows in the warehouse left me unsure if it was already dawn. As I calmed down and the adrenaline dissolved in my blood, I began to think more rationally. What if that woman was just a homeless person, mentally unstable, and became reactive to my unexpected action? Besides, what could an old lady do against me? I felt like an idiot, decided, with great caution, to open the door and try to talk or at least approach in a more peaceful way and understand the situation of that person. When I unlocked and peeked my eye out, I saw Mr. Gonzalez speaking like the sheriff, scribbling on a notepad while the old man spoke. I approached them and then both seemed confused. Jake, how did you get into the warehouse? He asked. Well, I had some problems last night and had to hide there. Did you just arrive now? Jake? Well, never mind. I'm glad you brought the sheriff because I think there's a woman who... Kid. He raised his voice. You've been missing for three days. No. What? Did I really spend all that time in there? But I didn't feel anything. Thirst? Sleep? What's going on here? Jake, you didn't spend the whole time in there, because the warehouse was the first place we checked when we arrived. I was stunned and disoriented. After a glass of water and sitting for a while, I finished telling them what had happened. Look, young man. I heard the alarm when you pressed it, and I ran here. Maybe 15 minutes at most. The store was deserted. I searched the warehouse, the bathrooms, everywhere, and nothing. Neither you nor Ryan, actually. Do you have any information about him? No, he left before all of this happened. Long before. He was all paranoid. You know how he is. Usually, the season is not that time of year, the sheriff murmured. What? I asked. I think we need to talk, Mr. Gonzalez said. I have a proposal to make, and you must decide what you want for yourself, right? If you want, I can fire you now and pay your rights and a hefty compensation. Or if you prefer to continue working here, you need to be aware of the risks you are taking. Not just the obvious ones like criminals or raccoons in the trash. Now go home. Take the day off for yourself and think about it. If you want to leave and put this behind you, which I completely understand, just send me a message and the money will soon be in your account. If you prefer the second option, meet me at the cafe today at 8pm, as I'll need to give you some information. He patted my shoulder, and I said goodbye. I ended up spending a good time responding to friends and family, modifying the story a bit, talking about a nighttime intruder, a physical confrontation, and how I ended up disoriented in the middle of the fight. Most didn't ask more questions and wished me well. Now what occupies my mind most of the time is the proposal I received. I really don't know if by continuing to work there, I'll be sinking deeper into this quagmire or saving myself. Saving myself from what? You might be wondering. Well, after a restless sleep on the couch, I woke up to a single knock on the door. 
I peeked through the peephole without seeing any trace of anyone, but when I opened the door and saw what was there, my stomach churned. A can like the one from last night, open and almost empty, with some sticky remnants at the bottom. The disturbing part, however, was the strange label, from a brand I've never heard of. On a vibrant yellow background, red letters announced, Canned Ryan. I felt nauseous instantly, locked myself in the house and refused to even look out the window. I've been in front of the computer ever since, writing this and would like some advice. Should I accept the proposal to continue working the night shift? Part 2 As some of you suggested in the comments, I decided to face the unknown and talk to Mr. Gonzalez about the unexplainable events at the convenience store. Since if he has been alive in the store for so long, he must know at least how to protect himself. I quickly packed my things, locked the door of my house with a mix of apprehension and distrust, put the Ryan can in a black bag, and took it with me as I headed to the cafe where we arranged to meet. Upon arrival, I found Mr. Gonzalez in a corner, fiddling with a cup of what looked like coffee, and upon closer inspection, turned out to be brandy. I sat down, greeting him, and he placed the cup on the table, giving me a consoling look. Jake, I'm glad you decided to come. Your courage is remarkable, and we need someone willing to face the unknown, Mr. Gonzalez said. And of course, I also bet 20 bucks with the sheriff that you would come, so thanks for the money too, he chuckled. I thanked him for the opportunity. The joke had eased the tension a bit, but every time I remembered what was in the bag in my hands, I trembled. I wanted answers. I wanted to understand what was happening in that store. Gonzalez seemed to sense my unease and began to explain. Here, Jake. We've been dealing with something ancient. Something rooted in the depths of the store. For years, even before I took over, Strange things happened here at night. Shadows, whispers, things that defy logic. But we've learned a basic rule. Ignore the thing, and it ignores us. Strange things? I asked. And why didn't you warn us? Did Ryan know about this? Well, Jake, the thing only really shows up after a certain time, when a new employee comes. They are left in peace for a while. Usually it's two or three months before things start getting weird. That's why we hired someone around this time of year. The thing manifests itself in the dead of winter and you can probably figure out why. Less movement, more tranquility, especially at night. And no, Ryan didn't know about this. This only increased my perplexity. Mr. Gonzalez was playing with lives here. I couldn't hold back and pulled the can out of the bag, placing it on the table. You knew? All along? Knew that negligence caused this? I pointed to the can. He seemed taken aback. His eyes widened and he made the sign of the cross. Jake, I... I didn't know that this could happen. Sweat started to bead on his forehead. But if I can at least defend myself... I decided not to tell you because things only start when you're aware of them, at least within the time frame I set. Three months is the maximum it takes for it to manifest and two months is the minimum. Usually it's during this period that I call new employees to explain more. Maybe Ryan found out on his own. Did he tell you anything? He seemed haunted lately. I remembered his paranoia. Yeah, he seemed frantic, but nothing much different from his usual conspiracy rants. I believe this time it was worse. He might really have found out, and I genuinely feel sorry for it, kid. He put his hand on my shoulder. And to prevent this from happening again, Gonzalez continued, now passing a folded paper to me. 
These are the new rules of the job. Consider it a contract. Follow them to the letter, and you can continue working here. Don't think it's a normal job. It's a pact we make to keep things under control. Accept this, and you'll be safe. I stared at the folded paper. Take as much time as you need to read it, and if you agree, just sign it and come to the store tomorrow. With a lump in my throat, I accepted the paper and unfolded it. The rules were written in an old typewriter font. They seemed like a mix of superstitions and strange instructions. The content of the paper was as follows. Contract to the Gonzales Convenience Store Rules Welcome officially to the Knight family. Firstly, we congratulate you on your courage in accepting this peculiar job. Here, you are not just serving customers, but dealing with forces beyond human understanding. Please read the rules below carefully as they are essential for your safety, and maintaining harmony in this establishment. 1. Greetings. By accepting this contract, you agree to keep sensitive store data confidential, namely, address, inventory reports, cash in slash out, names and social media of the establishment or employees without express authorization. Disclosing information will compromise not only your safety, but the safety of everyone around you. As for strange events, nothing will prevent you from sharing, but be aware that it may attract unwanted attention. 2. Nature of the store. Understand that the store is linked to a supernatural presence. It has existed for decades, and the exact nature of this entity is unknown. We ignore its existence, and in turn, it leaves us in peace. Don't try to understand it. Just accept it. 3. Lighting Always keep the lights on. Avoid dark areas as much as possible, as the creature seems to be drawn to darkness. Light is your ally. 4. Closed compartments when entering any rooms, such as bathrooms or storage rooms, do not close the door. The creature seems to have a control that we don't understand when you are in a closed room. Keeping doors open reduces risks. 5. Never-ending night. Remember the night in this store does not follow the common pattern. Time may seem stretched or reduced, and the line between reality and the supernatural may become blurred. Stay calm and continue with your tasks. 6. The Offering Upon arriving at the store, start your work as usual, but remember that at exactly 11.59pm, place a plate of raw meat in the office and lock it from the outside. Usually we ask the afternoon employee to prepare the meat and leave it aside, but if they are off or forgot, you can use one of the available meats in the store. It won't be deducted from your salary. 7. The Meat Corridor Pay special attention to the lights in the refrigerated corridor where we store meats and cold cuts. If the lights there go out, try to quickly illuminate the corridor for the next two minutes. This usually happens when you don't follow the previous rule. If you can't illuminate it, see Rule 9. 8. Night Customers Serve night customers as usual but avoid prolonged contact or excessive questions. Some of them may feel uncomfortable or not be what they seem. 9. The Weapon and Emergency Button Have the weapon under the counter and the emergency button always at hand. Use them wisely. They are your last resorts. 10. Special Coffee Always keep a fresh coffee available on the checkout counter. Some night customers have a preference for drinking something fresh at night, and if it's not coffee, they gladly accept to drink your blood. 11. Ignorance of Customers If any customers report a strange event, an appearance, or any of the elements mentioned here, just tell them it's nothing. Deny seeing anything, even if you did see something. Their ignorance protects them from the entity. 12. Your ignorance. Likewise, if you hear whispers, something's happening on your shoulder, 
footsteps behind you, or any of these lures, ignore them. If the creature knows that you know it's there, it won't have a reason to hide anymore and will become stronger. 13. Breaking the contract. Any attempt to break or disrespect this contract will result in unknown consequences. The responsibility falls on the signatory. By signing this document, you agree to strictly follow these rules. Remember you are now bound to something beyond human understanding. Good luck, and may your stay at the convenience store be long and safe. Employee's signature. I stared at the paper for a while, trying to understand. I think it must have been about half an hour or so until I decided to sign it. The extra pay for this would cover my college expenses and, well, if others have been in the store for so long, I believe the rules are themselves effective. Very well, kid. You can start tomorrow. All good for you? Uh, sure. <laughs> no problem. Either way, I couldn't sleep that night. Reversed circadian rhythm, coupled with anxiety and fear. I didn't have problems, at least not at home. At dawn, I went out to buy coffee and found a circle of small dead animals in the garden. That thing knew I was aware of it, and it wouldn't make things easy. I called Mr. Gonzalez, and he said that it's normal for such things to happen in the first week. The creature is testing you, seeing if you have the guts to stay in the store. I just wanted to finish telling you about some strange things. I'm now on the work shift and indeed, the boss wasn't joking when he said they test you. First I went to check a f toilet flush. A customer who had just left complained that it was stuck. I barely remembered to leave the door ajar, securing it with a nearby bucket. The flush was just too tight, and I loosened it a bit. Nothing major. However, as I was washing my hands, I saw the door sliding slightly. Starting to pick up speed, I ran over and held it. It wasn't as if the wind had pushed it. There was indeed some intentional force applied. I held it tighter, and finally exited the bathroom, looking behind the door. Nothing. Nothing until I felt a poke on my shoulder. There was no one behind me before, and I should just ignore it. I struggled to contain myself as I felt the breath of whatever it was making a condensed sweat on my neck. I walked slowly to the counter and continued to act normally. That's when a shadow began to enter my peripheral vision. A dark mass moving slowly in front of me. The creature from the other night with its oily hair in front of its face, came up to me, staring a few inches away. I grabbed one of the magazines and pretended to read Frozen with Fear. This thing doesn't stop haunting me, whether in front of me or whispering in my ear how delicious Ryan was, disappearing when a customer appears and returning as soon as they leave. I'm taking advantage of the moments when it's out of sight to continue writing here. The problem is that it's becoming more brazen, and it started licking my face about five minutes ago. A customer is deciding which flavor of energy drink to take, so I'm taking the opportunity to finish writing and post this. I don't think I'm in trouble, but I'll be making updates between customers until next time. Updates. Crap! I forgot to put the meat dish in the office. I'm going to call Mr. Gonzalez right away. Update 2. Okay, I think everything is fine now. I got yelled at, but I'm still in one piece. I'll bring more updates later. Part 3. Hello again. Jake here. First of all, thank you to everyone who has followed my story so far and expressed concern. Last night was tense. And I need to share the latest events. After the incident with the meat dish, I quickly pressed the button under the counter, summoning Mr. Gonzalez, expecting the worst. It felt like an eternity until he finally called me, making me jump back in fear at the ringing of the phone. His voice on the other end sounded calm, but I could sense the tension. You forgot the dish, didn't you, boy? He said straight to the point. 
Yeah, Mr. Gonzalez. I... I don't know how it happened. I only noticed when things became more... insistent. My voice betrayed my anxiety. Hmm. Happens to the best of us, Jake. The creatures like to test, see how far you can follow the rules. However, you need to be more careful. A breach in the contract can have unexpected consequences, and failures like this will not be tolerated. And I don't mean tolerated by me, if you catch my drift. Put the dish there, maybe it'll be in a huff and won't accept it, so keep an eye on the meat aisle. He hung up before I could thank him or ask more questions. I returned to work, still tense, keeping a close watch on every move making sure not to make any more mistakes. The night continued, customers came and went, and I kept the lights on, following the rules precisely. It seemed like the air around me was calmer, less aggressive. Even the creature that had licked my face had disappeared. Maybe it was satisfied with my discomfort and decided to retreat. I just hoped everything would go back to normal until around 3 a.m. The lights started flickering frantically, and a whispering voice echoed throughout the store. Indistinct words that I didn't even know in what language they were. Shelves shook. The objects were thrown off their shelves. A sinister presence hung in the air, making me cower on the floor. Terrified, I looked around, searching for something, and I realized a darkness spreading in the meat aisle. It was as if something prevented the light itself from entering there. I swallowed hard and quickly grabbed my flashlight. My hand started shaking as, shining the light into the darkness, I saw those dreadful eyes staring at me, along with the mouth where a piece of chicken lay. I kept the light strong on the aisle, barely holding on to the flashlight, and slowly, the presence dissipated. I couldn't see the creature anymore when the front door opened, and I jumped, pointing the flashlight right at the face of the entering customer. Oh, sorry sir, I said, turning off the light. He seemed unfazed. That's when I noticed him. A distinctly peculiar man. He wore a pulled down hat and sunglasses, even at night. Had long, graying hair and a stubbled beard. His furtive manner raised my suspicions, and I felt a shiver down my spine. He approached the counter, but something about him made me uneasy. His movements were calculated, and his eyes seemed to penetrate my soul. What do you want? I asked, keeping my voice steady. He smiled, a smile that didn't reach his eyes, remaining cold and expressionless. I'm looking for something special, he murmured, looking around the store. As he examined the aisles, I noticed his shadow moving. It didn't seem to belong to him, but rather followed him silently, with slightly different, slightly delayed movements. A wave of discomfort ran through my body. The customer finally approached the counter with a vacant look. Do you believe in secrets, Jake? He whispered, looking both ways. How do you know my... I began, now more uncomfortable than ever. Secrets hidden from you? Things that happen when you're looking the other way? I still don't quite understand what you're getting at. He put his hand in his coat and pulled out a black and white photo. To give you context, during the slavery period... There were a series of revolts known as the Texas Troubles, where slaves and abolitionists were pursued and later hanged. The photo in question depicted one of these situations. Two bodies were tied to a tree hanging by their necks, and below next to them, a man with a thick mustache posed with his rifle, as if boasting about a successful hunt. The thing is, a few seconds later I realized something. The man in question with the rifle was our sheriff, Butch Cornwell. But how? These events are from 1860. Think about it, kid. 
It seems like someone wants to hide something from you. Those words shook me. I always trusted the sheriff, believing he was keeping things under control, but now, in front of this stranger, I began to question if I really knew the man with the golden star. The mysterious customer left the store, leaving me perplexed and full of unanswered questions. The shadow continued to dance around him as if responding to his call. I decided that I needed to uncover the truth about the sheriff and what is really happening not only in the store, but in the whole town. There are more secrets hidden in the shadows than I could ever imagine. Well, the weekend is approaching, and some regional holiday festivities are coming up. I hope to keep an eye on Butch, and at least understand what's going on around here. It has crossed my mind that maybe it's a trick from the entity to break the trust between us. But I'm still not sure. That customer was eerie, but in a different way from the store. I'll keep you updated and welcome any tips on espionage you can give me. Part 4. Let me clarify a few things to start the conversation. Yes, I've been living here since I was born, and as far back as I can remember, so has Sheriff Butch. Asking my mom, she mentioned that Butch comes from a long line of law enforcement officers, starting with his great-grandfather. The Cornwell Patriarch, who already wore the badge back in his time, and apparently, they're stubborn about it. As both Butch's great-grandfather and grandfather died tragically in service, in a barn fire during an operation and in a car accident respectively. His father had dementia and was declared missing, although given the time that has passed, he's been dead for years. That said, our little town is getting ready for a party that promises to shake things up around here. The main street is adorned with colorful lights, and local merchants are setting up stalls for the celebration. It's a typical festival, called Robustelio in anticipation of year-end and Thanksgiving festivities. We usually gather on the street and share food, drinks, and games. Mr. Gonzalez is an enthusiast for the celebration, and, of course, being a good employee, I was tasked with getting some items from the store for the party. I was off that day, and I have to confess it's pretty weird to go out there without being on duty. Upon entering, I found the other employee. Dave, behind the counter. Dave is a middle-aged guy with graying hair and an expression that oscillates between exhaustion and cynicism. Hey Dave, preparations for the party? Uh, yeah, for Habistelio. Tell me, what do you need? Some drinks, some snacks. The town is going to be lively tonight. I'm sorry I can't cover this night. It must be tough to be here alone. I'll bring you a drink after your shift, I promise. Uh, it's okay. I enjoy being here when there's no one. It's therapeutic. Dave started sorting the goods and the conversation inevitably turned to the store and its... idiosyncrasies. Dave was the new employee who replaced Ryan. Hey Dave, I commented. Simulating a casual and ordinary conversation. Have you noticed anything strange in the convenience store? Dave. Ah, uh, the old Gonzalez convenience store. Sure, I've heard of some bizarre things happening, but every place has its secrets, right? Legends circulate through the streets, but so far, nothing has happened. Except for the animals rummaging through the trash bins me. Well, can you check one more thing for me, please? I think I need that beer brand Gonzalez likes. It's in the back of the store. Dave. Uh, sure, man. Be right back. I took advantage of Dave's departure to grab a thick slice of meat and put it on the office plate. I know, I didn't receive instructions for that, but I didn't want to risk encountering a canned Dave in the morning. A few hours later, the party was in full swing. 
The street was filled with laughter, lively music, and the tempting smell of street food. Kids ran around and stalls offered prizes. The smell of cotton candy filled my nostrils as I salivated. I decided to take a walk to see if I could find someone I knew. In the midst of the crowd, I spotted Sheriff Butch Cornwell and Mr. Gonzalez, both standing near a beer stand. I approached unconsciously remembering what the stranger had told me a few nights before. Hey, Sheriff. Mr. Gonzalez? Gonzalez. Jake, my boy. How's it going at the store? I'm surviving, Mr. Gonzalez. The night seems to be lively. Are you sure it's a good idea to leave Dave alone at the store? Gonzalez. I trust him. And especially in ignorance. He laughed. The guy has no idea what's going on there. And for now, let's keep it that way. You've kept the store entertained, though. Let it get used to the smell of the guy. I didn't know what it was, but there was something strange in the way Gonzalez spoke. Something intimidating. A grotesque mockery. I don't know, maybe it was the beer. Speaking of which, the sheriff turned his can upside down, letting a single drop fall. Butch. Damn. Just when I was starting to have fun. He scratched his head for a moment. Jake, come with me. I need someone strong and more sober than me to help me get the beer stock. Can you give me a hand? I have more at home. The idea of going to the sheriff's house made me a little nervous, but I didn't want to refuse. We crossed some streets while the sound of music and laughter faded, muffled as if the world had its volume muted. We arrived at the sheriff's old colonial house, a property with a classic style but in perfect condition. Large pointed spears rose at the gates while the moon reflected its light through crystal clear windows. He stopped and searched for the keys, struggling for a few seconds until he found and unlocked the door. The house had a strong smell. It wasn't a stench, but something more... chemical. It resembled the smell of a hospital, or maybe a solvent factory. Butch. There's a freezer in the basement. Can you grab a few packs in there? I have to deal with something upstairs. He started climbing the stairs. Well, I know you might be thinking it was foolish to go down to his basement despite my suspicions, but he was still the sheriff I had always known. And besides, numerous people had seen me leave with him. And if he really wanted to do something to me, he would have already. I descended the creaky and worn stairs. The basement was totally dark, but the chemical smell seemed weaker. I felt the wall until I touched the switch and turned on the light with a small click. It was as he said, a mini fridge full of beers. I had taken two packs and was preparing to go up when, turning, I saw something that caught my attention, under the stairs, a large covered pile. I approached trying to understand what those outlines were. Sharp angles, straights, they even looked like cans. I looked up the stairs to see if there was any sign of Butch, apparently not yet. Slowly I pulled the part of the tarp and looked at what was there, a heap of cans of leaching powder. I think that's where the chemical smell comes from. I swear I almost overlooked it, almost covered it back up and went up, but it seems my subconscious already knew what was going on. Behind the cans I saw a small part of the peeled and open wall, like a secret door. I pulled it carefully, and what I saw completely killed my appetite and the mood for the party. There were separate piles of clothes everywhere, tufts of hair and gnawed bones. It looked like some kind of clandestine cemetery. In the middle of all this, there was a wooden post, seemed to support the upper part of the house, but in the middle of it, two handcuffs with iron chains hung, and leaning against the trunk, a sepia photograph of a slave, a gray-haired black man looking directly at me. His gaze seemed to pierce my flesh and pierce my soul, 
feeding on it. It was agonizing. Uncomfortable seeing the mix of fear, hatred, and suffering on his face left me breathless. My back started to burn and throb. I almost passed out with the sensation. I just wanted to get out of there as quickly as possible. I closed the door and covered the pile, grabbed the packs, and started running towards the stairs when, turning the corner to go up, I came face to face with Sheriff Butch. Two steps away from me, standing. Butch, I almost thought you were dead. He laughed. I couldn't open the fridge. I think the seal got pressurized. Butch, ah yeah, that kind of thing is always happening. Well, let's go back before they miss us. He ran his hand through his graying hair, fixing his hairstyle. I followed him, still thinking about what I had seen. We arrived at the party, and I really tried to forget, but I couldn't. At least I hope I disguised it enough. I went home to sleep while Gonzales and the sheriff were still drinking on the sidewalk. When I went for my pajamas, I felt the fabric brushing against my back, causing a pain that wasn't there earlier. I ran to the bathroom and contorted to observe them in the mirror. My back was marked with rods, deep cuts that bled, as if I had been beaten and whipped all night. I slept in pain and turned on my stomach, pleading with any supernatural entity that it would pass soon. The next day I woke up with my boss at the door, ringing my bell insistently. Good morning, Gonzales. Any problem? I said between blinks and a yawn. Good morning, Jake. Can I come in? Feel free, I said, making way. He walked to the living room and sat on the couch, gesturing for me to sit too. I need to talk to you about the store. His expression became more solemn. Sure, I'm going for the night shift today, right? Relax, you know I don't mind going despite the night out. I'm not even hungover. Jake? It's Dave. He's dead. I trembled a bit. But how? I had talked to him yesterday. I had even left the plate in the office and locked it. Something wasn't right. Gonzalez promised me explanations today before my shift. I'm finishing updating you so I can go to work. I don't know what's going on, but I intend to put an end to it soon. Update? The bruises on my back are gone. Like they were never there. No scars or anything. Part 5 Hi everyone, Jake here. I know I've been gone for a while, but I'll try to catch you up on the past week. Things around here are totally crazy. Not just the workload, but also some weird stuff. Before I dive in, I want to thank everyone who has been following this story and providing tips and messages of support. It means a lot to me. As I mentioned before, Gonzalez came to my house to tell me about Dave's death. I was shocked and incredulous because I had seen him just a short time before at the store. Gonzalez explained that when he arrived to open the store, he found the door ajar. Lights flickering and an unusual silence. Upon entering, he encountered the shocking scene. Dave was on the floor, pale, eyes open in a vacant stare, with strange marks around him. At least this time it wasn't a can. The police found no clues and declared it as sudden death. Seeing Dave's mother crying at the funeral broke my heart. I offered my condolences and hugged her tightly. She's an elderly lady who didn't deserve to go through this. I wonder what would have happened if I had swapped places with Dave that shift. Or maybe, upon reflection, if I hadn't put the meat there. Yeah, it made sense. Maybe my offering at the office had invited the creature, and Dave unaware of the special rules, violated something. This thought started to gnaw at me bit by bit. The guilt was unbearable, and I had to talk to Gonzales about it. I decided to go to work early to have time to discuss it. 
I put on my uniform and started my walk to clear my head. As I approached, I could see Sheriff talking to the chief inside the store. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a busybody. But after everything, I decided to sneak up, crouching and approaching the window slowly. I caught the conversation halfway through. Gonzalez. It wasn't supposed to be Dave, Butch. The store is acting on its own. Butch. Look, the store got what it wanted, right? Just because it changed the order of things doesn't mean we need to panic. Gonzalez. It's the first time this has happened. It must really like Jake. Butch. We'll see about that. I accidentally stumbled on an empty beer bottle on the ground, making noise. They both stopped. The sheriff turned and began walking slowly towards me. I started moving towards the back of the store, but he was almost at a point where he could see me. I was just a few inches away and I could already see the brim of his hat and his eyebrows when one of the lights inside the store burst, making him turn, and Gonzalez jumped. Butch, <laughs> this thing is playing with us. It knows we're talking about it. You know, Beth, I always admired that stubbornness in you, that indomitable spirit made everything more fun. He tapped the wall twice. I backed away and arrived ten minutes later, casual. I greeted both of them and said I needed to talk to Gonzales alone. Gonzales. You can speak up, young man. I have nothing to hide from old Butch. Me. Well, it's about Dave. I put meat in the office that night. Thought I was protecting him. Butch approached me, chewing tobacco, and got so close I could smell the smoky scent coming from his mouth. Butch. Look, Jake, it's not your fault. The store is sometimes mysterious. Don't worry about it. He put his hand on my shoulder. Butch. You've got potential. Maybe when old Gonzales retires, you could even take his place. Me. No, no, you're exaggerating, sir. Gonzales. Can't deny it, kid. The store likes you. And I've been thinking about retiring for a while now. Butch's radio beeped. Butch. Gentlemen, duty calls. He left, and after a few minutes of conversation, Gonzales did the same. The night went on without many problems, and truth be told, no special rules needed to be followed. No lights, no strangers, nothing. It was around midnight when I heard a low, sinister laugh echoing through the store. I turned around, and there, in the dark aisle, was a familiar figure. The strange one with the hat. My legs hesitated before taking a step back. The figure advanced slowly, revealing glowing eyes. His hair looked even more unkempt and he ran his hand over his stubble. His shadow danced with joy, moving from one shelf to another, now completely independent of his body. Stranger. Beth knows you heard about her. Me. Uh, who? Stranger. Don't play dumb. It's ugly to do that after the mess she saved you from earlier. Butch doesn't like snoops. He reached into his coat and pulled out a USB drive violently, making me think he was armed, and I recoiled in fear. Before I could react, he disappeared as if he had never been there. The light stopped flickering, and the store returned to its usual silence. Nothing else happened that night. I was counting the minutes to go home and see what was on the device. I almost flew out the door when Gonzales arrived. He was covering the morning shift while the issue with Dave was still being resolved. Back home, I inserted the device and found some strange, minimal things. I couldn't copy or extract them. They seemed to have some encoding, so I'll just describe them. Some old photos of someone I now assume is Butch. Him with slaves. Next to hanged people in the Civil War with hooded figures wearing pointed hats. And the most disturbing of all, he was standing 
smiling sadistically while holding the chain that restrained a young girl. She had a gag and deep marks all over her body. She looked at the camera with profound hatred, conveying her disgust with the situation. This was just one of the folders. In another, there was a compilation of newspaper articles since around the 1950s about young people dying in the store, even before Gonzales. The last names of the sheriffs involved in the investigation were obviously the same. Cornwell. It also included headlines of accidents that killed Butch's predecessors. Levi Cornwell, the grandfather, and Josiah Cornwell, the great-grandfather. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I started writing this post for about ten minutes until my heart almost had an attack. Through the window behind me, allowing sunlight in, there was a shadow. A human, male shadow with a hat standing. I didn't know how long that person had been there, and by the hat, I could guess who it was. The shadow started moving. I saw it slowly going to the door, his silhouette passing. While walking, I saw him taking a rifle from his back, loading ammunition and putting it in. He stopped when he reached the door. Two knocks, hard and dry. Silence. Two more knocks. Suddenly my phone vibrates, a message from Butch. Hey Jake, you home? I need to talk to you. I found another batch of beers at home close to expiration, and I need to get rid of them, if you know what I mean. Update. He sent a new message. Well, unfortunately I can't wait long. I'm going to go into your kitchen to leave some cans on your counter. Just letting you know so you don't get scared if you're at home. Part 6 Hi. I'm writing this in a hurry, so please forgive any mistakes. Anyway, I think you remember how things were in the last part. Butch remained at the door, a menacing figure under the brim of his hat, holding a rifle. The sun was beginning to set, casting long shadows across the room. A tense silence hung in the air as I, with a racing heart, tried to make sense of everything that was happening. Did it have any connection to today's conversation? Butch. Jake, are you going to open the door, or should I come in? I choked at the moment. The words were laden with intent, and a sense of desperation seized me. Quickly, I grabbed my notebook and headed upstairs seeking refuge in the bedroom. With every step, the creaking sound of the floor echoed, alerting Butch to my escape. Butch. Jake, don't make this harder than it needs to be. Open the door. I ignored the plea and reached the room. Irregular breathing was the only sound in the room as I hid in the corner, contemplating what to do with the data. Perhaps I should release it, in case something happens to me. The door creaked open slowly, interrupting my thoughts. I began to hear the sound of boots ascending the stairs as I locked the bedroom door. Butch. Jake, it doesn't have to be like this. Open the door and we'll talk. He called my name with apparent calmness, but beneath it, the tone of his voice carried a grim determination. Ignoring his words, I climbed onto the bed trying not to be in the direct line of the door. He kicked once. Butch. If you want to do this the hard way. Another kick, and the door gave way, almost falling against the wall. Desperation grew within me and my gaze fixed on the window, the only escape route. Without thinking twice, I opened it and prepared to jump. Butch noticed my intention and took a few hurried steps in my direction. Butch, you're not getting away. The moment he raised the rifle, I jumped through the window, landing on the lawn below. The impact was harsh, but adrenaline blurred the pain, and my notebook cushioned the fall, I think, unfortunately. It broke in the process. As I got up, I heard shots echoing in the night but the shadows helped me escape as I ran towards the forest, seeking refuge. 
The shots failed to find their target, and the pursuit was just beginning. I disappeared into the shadows of the forest, determined to uncover the truth behind Butch's threats and find a way to stop it all. The forest was too silent, its twisted branches and dancing shadows amplifying the atmosphere. I ran, breathing heavily, trying to get as far away as possible from the threat following my every step. In the distance, I began to hear the hoarse and steady rumble of a jeep approaching. It was Butch. I left the main road and threw myself into the midst of the trees, lying face down in the middle of the dense bushes. Shortly after, the car parked a few meters away from me. Butch got out. I couldn't see him, but I heard his steps getting closer. And... was he sniffling? Look, kid, I can see you, and you're in serious trouble. Come with me to the station to sort things out, and I promise to go easy on you. Otherwise, I won't have any choice but to... I heard the rifle being prepared for a shot. Come on, I'll count to three. I didn't know what to do. Run or surrender. One. Was he bluffing? Two. Well, if he wanted to. Three. He fired upwards. Some birds flew and small animals scurried away. He kicked the car's body and got in, accelerating. I made the right bet. If he had seen me, he would have shot without saying anything. I waited a few minutes before continuing. At this hour of the night, moonlight fractured through the dense tree leaves, creating ethereal patterns on the ground covered with dry leaves. With every step, fear grew fueled by the uncertainty of what awaited in the depths of the forest. My body felt a tension of strong emotions. My joints ached and my body was feverish, but an urgency propelled me forward. The night sounds of the forest became sharper as I approached the town's perimeter. Broken branches under my feet echoed like gunshots, a sinister soundtrack for my escape. On the horizon, the familiar silhouette of the store rose like a shadow, a beacon of salvation or, perhaps, my final destination. The moon cast its light on the store's parking lot, creating a surreal view of the place that, not long ago, seemed like just an ordinary market. The facade was quiet and dark, but the echo of my footsteps seemed to fill the void with palpable tension. The fear of being followed persisted. I looked in every possible direction as many times as I could. I approached the entrance hesitantly, as if the sheriff would jump from the heavens and kill me with his own hands. The door creaked as I pushed it, making the bell ring, revealing the silent and unexplored interior. You might think it was reckless to come to my workplace, but you see, since Dave's incident, we hadn't found a replacement. I knew the other employee who worked in the morning, a college student who couldn't wait to leave the store, whose boyfriend promptly picked her up. The store would either be empty or occupied by someone with no desire to work, and unaware of what was happening. I entered slowly and surveyed the empty interior. Most lights were off, creating dancing shadows, and the characteristic smell of dusty products filled the air. A shiver ran down my spine when I realized I wasn't alone. The figure I saw on my first night, the woman with hair over her face, emerged from the shadows. A slender and threatening figure. But this time, it was different. I felt no fear. She floated calmly, not projecting herself towards me. In fact, it was as if she waited for my arrival. That mysterious visitor came from one of the shelves talking. He had no shadow. Jake, you're finally here. I'm sorry for how things unfolded. Me. What's happening? Who are you? Why is Butch trying to kill me? Butch is just fulfilling an ancient agreement, settling the debt with the store. Do you have time to hear a story? His deeply wrinkled eyes carried a seriousness that conveyed a long and dark tale. Well, the well-known sheriff, Butch Cornwell, 
is actually older than any of you. He was an overseer on one of the slave farms in this region about two centuries ago. I suppose you suspected, right? He showed the photo he had given me when we first met. He wasn't just another overseer. He truly reveled in it, like hunting animals, he said. There were tumults during the abolition period, revolutionaries, reformists, rebellions, and repression. There was a young woman named Beth. She was a slave. She fell in love with a man who was born a slave but bought his freedom. He raised his hands, bringing them together in front of his body, causing the sleeves of his coat to retreat and reveal shackle marks on his wrists. I was the young man, Kenway, at your service. He bowed with his hat, Kenway. But you see, I fell in love with Beth. I wanted to marry her. We spoke with Reverend Bates. He was an abolitionist who had agreed to perform our marriage, which, by right, would make her no longer belong to her former owner. She would be married to a free man, and therefore free. But that's when conflicts erupted. Butch was never sympathetic to it, and when he found out, he incriminated us claimed we were planning to release all the slaves and take over the town. With that, taken to a mob trial, we were condemned. The Reverend was hanged shortly after. We weren't as fortunate. He did, well, horrible things to Beth. I think I don't need to mention what they were. He tied me up and made me watch while he was there, again and again. He gagged her after she bit him. But that didn't stop him. He used everything to hurt her. Whips, hot iron, even some shots. The store lights began to flicker. Kenway. Sorry, Beth, but he needs to know. He looked at the woman with long hair. Her gaze was teary. Kenway. Finally, when he got tired, he tied her to a log, cut out her tongue, and left her there to die. As for me, I was a citizen with rights. I couldn't be treated that way, so he put me at her feet and shot me, forbidding my body to be buried until Beth died too. He wanted her to see me rot. Uh, I don't even know what to say. Don't say anything. Hatred. Pain, all together, made Beth's spirit wander. As you can see, she can't speak, so I ended up being her spokesperson. We went after Cornwell. At the time, he wasn't called Butch. He was Josiah. He evaded us for a while, until we thought he had died in an accident. But no, it turns out the curse caught up with him too. He doesn't die until Beth kills him. But after so many escapes, he found a way to continue his life. The store. The store? What do you mean? Well, the store was built on the site of our death. We need to stay nearby, or we could lose strength and even fade away. So he proposed the following deal. He would bring people here, like store workers, and Beth could feed on them to quench her thirst. He would cover up the deaths. I'm sorry for this, but when Beth goes into her frenzy for blood, she becomes much more aggressive. I can't even manifest myself here because of how strong her presence is. That night, it should have been you, but for some reason, Beth liked you. She saw potential in you to help us end Cornwell. She doesn't want to do this anymore. He looked at her and held her hand. We don't want this anymore. But why didn't you just end Butch? Just feed on him? We would have done that a long time ago, but he's cautious. He avoids the store at night, where we are stronger, and anyway, he walks around with a protection amulet. Amulet? Yeah, it's bizarre, but he always carries a bone from each of us tied to his body. He found out about it, and managed it over a century ago. Since then, we can't even get close to him anymore. That's why we guided you. 
so that he could follow you here. Follow me. Tire sounds echoed from the parking lot as the jeep parked carelessly. Cornwell got out with red eyes and his rifle in hand, walking with strong steps. I could hear him shout. Get out of there, you coward. Don't make me drag you out. At least act like a man in your death. I looked at Kenway. Kenway. Continue here. Remove the bones hanging from him. One is on the leg, the other on the neck. Two small and worn flanges. We can help you survive, but if he comes in here, our presences won't be visible anymore. Can you do that? I honestly don't know. Part 7. The final part. I know I left you all hanging, but I finally had time to wrap up my story. As you read through it, you'll understand why. Thanks for sticking around. Have a great end of the year and a happy holidays to all of you. May God help us. Well, the room was tense, filled with silence only broken by the distant rumble of Butch's jeep. I looked at Kenway, a mix of confusion and determination in his eyes. He nodded, conveying a confidence I wasn't sure he possessed. Kenway. You can do this, Jake. Remember, he's vulnerable now without the amulet. You can use some weapon or whatever to stun him. He may not die, but he can still feel pain very well. Butch, outside, continued yelling as he approached the door, anger overflowing in his words. I decided to act quickly, rushing to lock the entrance and buy some time. After doing that, I went to the counter and fumbled blindly underneath to grab the weapon as quickly as possible. I couldn't find it, and Butch kept advancing, now more slowly. I crouched to look, and the old smoke-stained barrel wasn't there. I heard a mechanical click behind me. It seems I had found the weapon, and it was cocked and aimed at me. Mr. Gonzalez. Jake, my boy. You've got yourself into trouble, huh? He smiled, but it was an empty smile, betrayed by hidden malice. Butch approached, eyes fixed on me, and Gonzalez blocked my escape route. Me. What's going on here? Mr. Gonzalez, are you betraying me too? Mr. Gonzalez. Betrayal? Not exactly. I'm just doing what's best for me. Still with the gun pointed at me, he walked backward to the door and unlocked it, letting the sheriff in. Butch. Looks like your boss here made the right choice. Now, Jake. It's time to pay for your misdeeds. He aimed his rifle. Butch. Come on, bring it. I hate shooting people like you. Need a good excuse that you attacked first. I stood still, looking at him. There was nothing that could be done. Butch. Okay, you've exhausted me. Say goodnight, Jake. Goodnight, Jake. A ghostly voice echoed. And with that, all the lights in the store went out. Except, I think, for the soda machine. Butch. What the hell, Gonzalez? Quickly, find the circuit breaker. I felt like a guiding hand, an intuitive force showing me where and how Butch was. I lunged at him, turning his gun away, just seconds before Gonzalez lit the light. We were then in this body-to-body -body game to try to take the gun from each other, when a sharp crack whizzed by my ear, making me deaf for a while. Gonzalez almost shot me. Mr. Gonzalez. Don't make things harder. Be a good collaborator, Jake, as you always were. Butch tried to push me into the line of fire. I was lost. That's when, over his shoulder, I saw the office open. Under his desk, an empty meat plate. Would I die? Maybe, but it was a necessary risk. I grabbed the gun more tightly and pushed Butch with my shoulder. He grabbed my shirt and pulled me along the gun flying from my hands and landing at the feet of my now ex-boss. 
I quickly locked the door when we entered. It was time for the nightly snack. And if I had to send this damn racist to the devil, God, I would be part of the feast with pleasure. The sheriff clung to the bones like talismans, and now that I could see them clearly, it was a few seconds of silence and tension, but nothing. Suddenly outside, a noise started. It was Gonzales. It started with shouts that seemed like fear, then panic, and finally, pain and suffering. He begged to die two or three times before falling silent again. Wet noises of things breaking and swallowing filled the air. Butch and I didn't even react for that moment until, suddenly, I jumped on one of the bones on tying its knot skillfully. Butch, you damn traitor, what's happening here? He said, regaining his senses and advancing towards me. I put my full weight on the ground and pushed him up, giving a kick with all I had. He flew backward, hitting his back on a filing cabinet and falling. I ran to the door and opened it, ready to see a sea of blood. However, nothing. Just one of the guns, a standard deputy's rifle. I quickly ran to the gun while already hearing Butch approaching. I threw myself on the ground to grab it, and when I turned, he was almost on top of me. I saw his expression change when he saw the gun, and realized I was about to shoot. I pulled the trigger, and I watched as the quick fragments opened spots leaking red all over his shirt. He fell, and without wasting time, I stood up and gave two more shots one of them in his face. I checked for a moment his vital signs. He was dead, but I knew not for long. I looked at the amulet in his hand. It was loose, almost hanging. I ran my fingers over it. Instantly, like a contraction, his fingers closed and his hand became a fist hitting my face. I fell backwards, seeing stars as he took the rifle from my hand. I walked back helplessly as he pointed the barrel at me, about to shoot. The empty click echoed one, two, three times. There were no more bullets. Butch. No problem. He took the gun as if it were a bat and it hit my stomach. I fell, unable to breathe. Butch. It's going to be more fun. I grabbed a can from the bottom shelf and hit his face now decayed but quickly taking its original form again. He howled as I struck the rough-edged metal on his nose, still without skin. I gave another blow, breaking the thin aluminum can. He, however, held my hands. He squeezed my fist into a closed shape, causing one of the fragments of the can to pierce my palm with more and more force. I lost strength doing that, and he handcuffed me. Butch. We always got along, didn't we? He spoke while rubbing his nose, now almost complete. Butch. You just had to play your part, but you had to meddle where you weren't called, huh? He hung his macabre pendant around his neck while I tried to deal with the pain and move away as much as possible. He noticed and calmly, with the same sadistic smile from his past photographs, he took a hunting knife from his belt. Butch, you're going to bleed, kid, like a pig. I had walked to the wall. He was a few steps away. There was no way out. I was helpless, hands tied. But then it came to me, the idea that could end it all. I projected myself toward him, raising my arms. I think he didn't expect that because he didn't defend himself. I drove the fragment that was in my hand into his neck, passing through the cord of the amulet. At the same time, I felt a sharp pain on the side of my body. We both hit each other. Butch. You got me. For real. He spun the knife. But if I go down, you're coming with me. Blood started to trickle from his mouth and he recoiled. Kenway appeared along with Beth. She stepped on the small bone, crushing it. Kenway. Judgment time has come. Time to reap what your actions have sown. 
Not just for what you've done to us, but for all those who died in your place. For this entire town. Butch, get on with it already. You're going to give a little speech now? Beth lunged at him, tearing a chunk from his shoulder with a bite. He screamed piece by piece. Inch of flesh by inch of flesh, she devoured him. He remained conscious the whole time, even though biologically it shouldn't be possible. I turned away not to look when there was only half of his body. I felt a hand on my shoulder. Kenway. You can look now, Jake. Again, we apologize for everything. I guess we caused trouble too, but at least it's over. Don't worry about anything. We'll figure out a way to clear your name. I felt a pulsation in my abdomen. The cut was bleeding thick blood. I fell to my knees. Kenway. We called the police and an ambulance. Thanks again. My vision blurred a bit as I fell face first onto the cold floor. I saw the couple walking out. They walked hand in hand. After a few steps they stopped, turned to me. Kenway tipped his hat in a greeting and Beth, in the same manner, lifted the corners of her dress in a brief curtsy. And with that, I blacked out. I woke up hours later in a hospital. The staff asked some questions and days later the police came. Apparently someone had made an anonymous tip by phone, saying they saw the sheriff trying to shoot me and stabbing me. He is now a fugitive, and Gonzalez is considered his accomplice. Legally there were no heirs, so until further notice, I'm in charge of the store now. I started walking freely two days ago, made some changes to the store, cleaned the place, Rearranged the stock, and now, you could say there are no more special rules for the night shift. There haven't been any more strange incidents. Or, rather, just one. Yesterday I was in the store during the night shift when I decided to close. It was around 1am. I walked through the cold parking lot when something hit my foot. It was a can. I looked up and I saw a figure in a hoodie looking at me. He started approaching and by the moonlight, I saw his face. Me. Didn't expect to see you here. Everything okay? Ryan. I've been talking to Dave and, well, it seems like you need some employees. What do you think? I smiled. Mind working the night shift?